Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. I am excited to have with me today Robert E. Cook, author of The Mahdi, a techno-national security thriller produced as a full-cast audiobook, and it is the fourth book in the Cooch series of national security thrillers. So, Bob, welcome. Thank you, Becky. That's so good to be with you today. So tell us a little bit about your background. You've got this series of national security thrillers. Tell us a little bit about what led you to start writing this particular series and this kind of content. Well, we were, uh, my wife and I were on a cruise in Vietnam, and we left Saigon and we're heading north to Da Nang and got into 60-foot seas and 40-knot winds across the bow of Typhoon. Wow. And everybody was sick except me. So I got out my computer and started writing on. Amazing. And that was the first one. (laughs) Wow. And what kind of research did you find yourself delving into as you moved forward with your series? You know, there's a lot of really good research available on the internet. You got to look for it. And so I would go to Wikipedia and Google different terms. And I ended up deciding that if there were going to be more of them, it would be handy to have a connection into the Middle Eastern world. That means you have to have a Muslim there someplace. Mm-hmm. And so his mother is a Bedouin, married to a U.S. Marine. And that sort of put it all together. And I did research. And uh, there was less research in the first one than there were in the next three. And what kind of career did you have leading up to this point where you started writing on the high seas? Before that, I had been a software executive. Had started uh, three different companies and taken them public, and then finally retired. And uh, three—it was three years after I retired that I got into the siphon. So it seemed like an opportune time. Yeah. Now you chose this particular region, this you know a particular set of complicated political issues and challenges. What was it that attracted you to that? particular set of problems and part of the world? The complexity of being a Muslim, especially in the Middle East, was uh, very interesting to me. And the way we treated it was very interesting to me. So I thought that I could create lens of a Bedouin American protagonist that would give a different view, a different look uh, to the novels. And that, that really got the whole thing going. Yeah. Did you always enjoy as a reader or audiobook listener? Have thrillers been an area or a genre that have been of particular interest to you? I've always been a big thriller fan from Tom Clancy back in the old days. Yeah. You know, through Lee Child and a bunch of other writers, you know, who, as well as I do. The the best selling thrillers, I've read them all. That's great. The first books of the series, what led you to this particular fourth book? Did you feel, let let me ask this first, the first three books, would you consider them standalone books? They're part of a series, but I try to make them standalone. And the second, the first book was about druggies in California. And it wasn't all that uh, oriented to Islam and being a Muslim. His father won the Medal of Honor in Vietnam and was in a wheelchair. And he I had him get in trouble in high school. So they put him in the Marine Corps. And then another one of the lead players, McMillan, got him out of the Marine Corps and put him in the special operations at CIA. And it sort of all came together. The second book was set in Yemen. And there was a lot going on in Yemen. and, And it seemed to me that that would be a reasonable base for my key player, uh, Kuhulam, to start to work. And so 
That involved a uh, nerve gas attack on the football playoff game in Dallas. And he foiled that, of course. And, and I had him speak a lot of languages. He speaks fluent Spanish because his mother taught now to service. He speaks fluent Arabic because he went every summer to his grandfather's home in Tangier. It was easy to sort of put it all together from there. Yeah, nice. So clearly you have some threads in the, you know, in the military, in terms of bringing in different military aspects, uh, you know, into the stories. Did you serve in the military yourself? I did. I was in for five and a half years and spent a year in Vietnam. And I was interested in, I thought it was going to stay. My first wife didn't think so. And turned out she was right. But, but. <laughs> I had done quite a bit of work in tactics and strategy, gone to command and general staff college. So you, you get a pretty good sense of what you'd like to know, what you don't need to know. And it was useful in creating that kind of backdrop for the novels. Yeah. And then have you enjoyed writing, you know, just the process of writing for most of your life? Or where, where did that interest begin? I had done a fair number of articles for my software career in different technical magazines, but you sort of get used to it and you you learn to throw out the words you don't need and keep the ones you do need, make them a little better. And and the whole thing was uh, an interesting drill. And then when I was stuck in the ocean, it came back to me and I started just to structure and outline a a, a whole new thing, a, a thriller. Yeah. When you were writing the Mahdi, did you map it out, the story in advance? Did it sort of form in your head and then you just started writing? Did it, how do, I'm always so interested in how stories come to authors because each author has their own unique way that they, they come. What was yours? Well, I, you know, there's, there's been a long time between my novels. So I have plenty of time to figure out what I'm going to do. In this case, I was in February of 18. I was reading an article in The Economist about uh, Israel was confiscating Israeli citizens' land who happened to be Muslim because they weren't Jewish. And the U.S. had gone against it. The International Criminal Court had ruled against it. Everybody and their brother was ruled against it. And Israel said tough, which they're saying right now. And so it's, I said, maybe there's a book there for me. So you, you set your alerts and you start to read. And the more I read, the more it seemed that there was a novel there. And I'm pretty happy with it. The, the Israel's played right along. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's a great novel. And uh, we're going to dive a little deeper just a little later. I want to ask you some more questions specifically about the audiobook process. But there is something that, that you have shared that I want to delve into a little bit. And You've said that in your experience so far with this particular book, that there's been a kind of knee-jerk reaction in reading it that the Mahdi is anti-Semitic. And yet, after just a few minutes of discussion with someone who expresses that, that they come around. Tell us a little bit more about why you think you get that initial reaction and also what it is that demonstrates that it is not anti-Semitic. It's interesting because I have several very good friends who are Jewish who had that knee-jerk reaction. And it ended up with them saying, never again. And so they think you can't let the camel's nose under the tent. And so we will never have that kind of uh, devastation that you found in the Holocaust. And they, when you say, wait a minute, what I'm doing is doing a logical case of the way Israel makes its future stay solid. And there is no future in Israel becoming a Jewish theocracy. It's too small. It's not mighty enough. And there are 200 million Muslims on your next door neighbors. And that makes it very difficult. And when they looked at the arguments where I tried to include not only the liberal Muslim, and there are a lot of nuts of liberal Muslims, as everybody's aware, but... uh, I tried to include the the liberal Jews. And there are a lot of liberal Jews. The whole diaspora in New York is basically liberal. 
but they have that knee jerk reaction. And so you just have to talk your way around it. And yeah, I think even, and you, I think you make this clear, as does, you know, the news in many ways about how also what you're, it seems like what you're, you're framing and, and showing is how, you know, the never again is not just for the, the, the Jewish people, but also for every other grouping of people. We can group ourselves in any number of ways, you know, by any number of characteristics, not necessarily religious or anything else. But, you know, with the Palestinian people being in a a place akin to what the Jewish people were experiencing in the Holocaust. Would that does that sound like a, a an accurate statement? Well, you know, never again is sort of a slogan, an aphorism that has evolved since World War II, when they managed to slaughter 10 million of them with no reason. And the rest of them were upset, and I don't blame them. But, but the, the, the key for me is how do you maintain a 50-year horizon or a 10-year horizon? And they're, they're in danger. The Israelis are in danger of falling into Thucydides' trap, which is... Well, the city was general in Peloponnesian Wars. And when Sparta saw that Athens was coming up to be a, a threat, they attacked it. And, and Israel's in that boat because their lead is in technology and communications. And they are a military hegemon, but they are not a thought leader in the eyes of the Islam nations around the world. And of course the Jews have been prosecuted over the years, persecuted from way back. But way the way I ended the Mahdi was with Israel being the intellectual and technology leader of the Middle East, bring the Middle East up to current standards. They built the they were going to build the schools, build the hospitals, build the universities. And I had Saudi Arabia, US and Israel splitting the costs. Of course, that's that's my novel. That was fiction. It hasn't turned out quite that way. And uh, there's a fair amount of uh, slugging it out going on. And right now, Israel's right on top of it all because of their technical and communications expertise that won't last forever. So if they win this one and slaughter another million Palestinians, that just means there's Still 2 billion Muslims left in the world to be angry. And you don't want that when the, when the gap's going to close in technology the way Thucydides said it would. Yeah. Do you want to tell us more about the Thucydides trap? Well, yeah, I'm a Machiavelli fan. And that's hard for people to believe. But he studied uh, Thucydides and the way it worked. And, and Machiavelli, by the way, is sort of one of the military thought leaders of the 15th century, because he invented the militia that defends the homeland. Before he started figuring that out, everybody hired mercenaries. And if you're the mercenary, you don't get paid as much as the guy next door. You go over next door and join that guy. And so that wasn't a wonderful way to run a railroad. And uh, he figured it out. He also studied when Sparta, Sparta won that war with Athens. But they ended up not, because time took over, and Athens continued to grow, just as Islam will continue to grow. There are two billion people around the world, B-word, billion. There are six million M-word Israelis in a country the size of New Jersey. That, that just doesn't last unless you get on board and play the game. And the city said that only, it's only a matter of time. And that trap is closing every year. And you can see that. Iran is next door to having a a nuclear weapon. That will change the game. Israel's nuclear hegemony dominates the Middle East. I'm really interested in these kinds of conversations, uh, partly because I uh, will uh, frankly admit that I have known very little about the history of that 
region and it you know it's been way outside my area of expertise so i'm fascinated by these kinds of conversations because they stir up the conversation they stir up the dialogue around what's happening and what i've found and we've been uh, producing several audiobooks that are more that where there are more political components or historical, political, sociological components. And I find that for myself, this is a big, there's a lot of learning that's going on. And so I really enjoy having these kind of conversations and and learning and, and just even having my uh, my thoughts, well, sort of challenging me, I guess is, is what I would say. I hope to cr- create that same sort of mystery that can be answered in, in the reader that I go after. And the uh, the conversation is one that people don't think about that much. But if you can structure it so much that, that they're willing to look at it, there's a lot of information there. And looking into Islam and and understanding the religion is interesting for a good Lutheran boy like me, but uh, it's, I don't have a dog in this fight. I just want to have a conversation. I want to, I want to have a thoughtful conversation about what makes sense for a huge population of the world that's underserved. Yeah. Let's uh, take a short pause and we're going to come right back and talk about the audiobook. From Ippy gold medal winner Robert Cook comes the fourth installment in the Cooch series. With all the classic elements of a spy thriller, intrigue, violence, sex, the Mahdi is a narrative geopolitical battlefield where Islamic and Jewish ideologies clash, seen through the lens of a modern liberal Muslim. Raised in a blend of Bedouin tradition and Western education, Alex Kahulin, Cooch, is a former U.S. Marine, CIA operator, and entrepreneur. Partnered with Dr. Caitlin O'Connor, the self-described smartest person in the world, they make an unlikely yet formidable duo. When Alex takes on a mission to reclaim stolen Bedouin land, he finds himself imprisoned and branded a criminal. Meanwhile, Caitlin faces her own dangers, becoming the target of an extremist plot. But the rules of warfare change forever when Caitlin condenses an electromagnetic pulse into shootable ammunition and deploys an AI chatbot quantum computer that can use the internet to control secure Israeli communications and provide strategic intel. As tensions escalate, some begin to believe that Alex may actually be the Mahdi, the prophesied redeemer of Islam. But can he shoulder that mantle? And can technology and enlightened thinking prevail over entrenched dogma? Get your copy of The Mahdi today at Amplify Audiobooks. So tell us why you chose to approach the audiobook as a full cast kind of project. I tried to envision... Uh, when I was talking to Pro Audio Voices, I tried to envision one person doing the whole book or two, and it just didn't work. It was a complex set of characters. In the case of an African American, you go after a guy who sounds like he's African American. That's a distinct accent, except among the top of the intellectual heap, where they fake a normal accent like the rest of us. And uh, otherwise, you can hear it in the tone. And it turns out that person has to serve a number of roles. But I can't imagine that one voice being more than a few characters because you can only change the voice so much. In the case of one of the key players was the head of Mossad as a woman named, doesn't matter what her what name was, but I had established a connection with Mossad in the second and third books. So it was easy to roll into it. But she had have an accent that made her sound like she was a Jewish intellectual. I mean, she knew about this city. She knew about Machiavelli. They both studied the same people. And 
So you you talk to the casting people with pro audio voices, and they served up a lot of different voice sets. Of course, I never saw any faces, didn't matter. And I tried to figure out how the woman that played, uh, and you may be comfortable with this, the woman that played the uh, head of both sides played a number of other parts with different accents, only one of which was the U.S. accent. And uh, she did that well. Thank you for that. But uh, the casting was what really made me pick a large full cast audience rather than a smaller number of cheaper uh, operations. If I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. I want people to have a good time listening to the book and not have to worry too much about the cadence and the accents. So, Yeah. And just to circle back to something you had commented earlier, um, you know, about like a normal accent. And of course, to each of us, our own accent is the normal one, right? And one of the, so just using that as a way to also point out in the casting process that we're always doing our best to find people who actually are of the heritage or of the culture that is where those characters are of those characters. And there's a real challenge, uh, and it's a challenge in the industry in general as well. When we have people who are playing multiple roles, they can only you know, sometimes you're using an accent that maybe isn't of your cultural heritage, you know, and so trying to find that right balance between the best storytelling and uh, appropriate accents and casting, you know, with uh, sort of honoring different cultures is a can be a challenging mix. It's a matter of verisimilitude, of course. Mm-hmm. And... Uh... I was amazed. Now, these narrators, at least the ones they got from variety of voices, were all professional actors or very close to it, professional narrators. So they're used to the challenge of a slight difference in accent. Now, I can hear the difference between a Pittsburgh accent and a Cleveland accent. I work both places, you learn it. But most people can't. And if there is an accent that is Middle Eastern in some way, you can pull it off for an Arab, for an Israeli, for almost anyone, as long as it's in that section. Now, if you want to go to Asia, that's a whole different set of accents, and that's harder. But, uh, yeah, there's the very similitude is, uh, is shocking when you hear the pros go from one role to another, when one with foul, foul language, another one is a pure thing. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything, uh, as we know we've been talking about casting, is there anything else or uh, in particular about the process of producing the audiobooks so far, or the audiobook, that has stood out to you so far? We've talked about casting, but if is there's anything else that maybe was surprising to you or, you know, I always like to call out those kinds of things because we have a lot of listeners on our uh, to our channel, our podcast, that are authors and are haven't had the experience of producing audio yet. So uh, anything that jumps out at you? I had never listened to a single audio book before this one was produced. And I was amazed. This is pretty exciting. It, it, this book takes quite a while. And I could be writing a book and reading this book, writing a bicycle and reading this book kind of thing. You know, you just listen to it. And it doesn't take all your attention, all your attention, but you get to rewind and listen to it again if you, if you hear a section. You can't do that with a book very easily. You don't want to go back and find a page where you thought you heard something. And uh, so the putting together the people and, and the, the integration of all the different voices into a, a single tale, a single story, was quite interesting. And, and it was very well done. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. And how can our listeners learn more about you and your writing? What is your website? RobertCookNovels.com. So it's all one string, RobertCookNovels.com. And there's a fair amount of information there that uh, on all four of the books. So you can get a summary of uh, the Mahdi, which is a, a kid from North Carolina, ended up in Tangier 
running a war in in Gaza. I mean, that's that's hard to do, but it, it's all there, and it's fun. It's fun to write it. It's it was fun to listen to, it. and I'm surprised. But I'm going to listen to more books now. Great. And if you haven't gotten your copy yet of uh, The Mahdi by Robert E. Cook, it at the time of this will go live. It will be available on Amplify Audiobooks and will also become available on all other audiobook platforms. So, Bob, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Becky, for setting it up. It was fun. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.